Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Columbia Alumni Association's Columbia at Home series. We're so glad we, you've joined us today. I'm Donna McPhee. I'm a graduate of Columbia College, uh, the class of 89, and Vice President for Alumni Relations and President of the CAA. Welcome. We're so excited. Tonight, we're joined by Michael Heller and James Salzman. They will be introducing us to the concepts they explore in their new book, Mind, How the Hidden Rules of Ownership Control Our Lives. It is featured in the books column in the new issue of The New Yorker. Near the end of the program, we'll have an audience Q&A, so feel free to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen to submit a question. I'm now pleased to introduce Michael Heller. He is one of the world's leading authorities on ownership on who gets what and why. He is the Lawrence A. Wien Professor of Real Estate Law at Columbia Law School, where he has served as the Vice Dean for Intellectual Life. Professor Heller's teaching and writing helps people see and cure ownership dilemmas no one has previously noticed. He's joined by co-author James Salzman, one of the world's leading environmental theorists. He is the Donald Bren Distinguished Professor of Environmental Law with joint appointments at UCLA Law School and UC Santa Barbara Bren School of the Environment. Professor Salzman's broad ranging scholarship addresses topics ranging from water to water life, from climate change to creating markets for ecosystems. I'm now pleased to welcome them both to Columbia at Home. Thank you so much, Donna. Um, I've been teaching at Columbia for 20 years now, and I still feel this incredible sense of joy and actually gratitude when I walk across the street from my apartment at 116 and come onto campus. I'm really glad that you're all here with us tonight. Um, and what I want to do is start today by heading us uh, to the airport. This is a place that many of us have not visited uh, for a while. Um, let me get this um, set up here. Um, okay, so this is the plane that we're going to start you out with. Um, and on the plane, we actually have a hero and a villain, and I'm not going to tell you who is which. This is James Beach. He's actually a pretty big guy. You can see this in the slide. He's over six feet tall. He was, at least before the pandemic, a pretty frequent business traveler. He was on a crowded flight from Newark to Denver. He's in the middle seat there in row 12, pretty far back. The plane takes off. He lowers his tray table, he takes out his laptop, and he also takes out his knee defenders. Uh, those are the little clamps there in the circled in the green. Uh, he clamps those to the front of his tray table. And once he does that, um, the, the clamps stop the seat in front from reclining onto you. So he's pretty assured of his space. He has his laptop up, he has his clamps on, he starts typing. The claims are really for real for these, these knee defenders, they work. The passenger in front, she realizes she cannot recline her seat. She sees there's a problem. She slams her seat back. The knee defenders pop out. It jolts the laptop right into James's lap. He jams the seat back up. He reattaches the, knee, the, the clamps. She then turns and throws her water in his face. This is a real story. So we don't know how this would have escalated. The pilot makes an emergency landing. Both passengers are taken off the plane. The plane continues on like an, about an hour and a half late. This brawl very quickly went viral. And this fight that we're starting with may seem foolish, it may seem kind of stupid, but this fight, the knee defender fight, reveals a huge amount about how the hidden rules of ownership really work. So tonight we're gonna to start with three questions. Um, and here's, here are the questions we're gonna be asking. Why is reclining even in an ownership conflict in the first place? Why are these battles breaking out now? And Who's the hero? So for the first question, I'm gonna to go to Jim. Thanks, Michael. So why is reclining, reclining even an ownership issue at all? You basically see as a fight that's going on on the plane. Well, here's what's really going on. Uh, there's a wedge of space behind the seat. It's shown in yellow of this triangle. In the slide, and the real conflict is over who controls that wedge of space. Does it belong to the recliner in front or the knee defender in back? And of course, these conflicts occur in other parts of, of flying as well. So think about, you know, when you get in a plane, you're in a middle seat, someone sits down next to you and you've got the armrest, 
we all know what's going on, right? There's an unspoken jostling. A, 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 the photo here is of when an entrepreneur came up with to try to avoid that. But the fact is that there is conflict over resource control, over overhead baggage space, the window shade up or down. Every inch on board is contested. It's even more the case today with concerns over social distancing. This is true not just on airplanes. Ownership invisibly shapes every day of our lives, every minute. These are the rules that decide who gets what and why. Whether you stand at the front of the line or the back, it's where you live. It's what medications you take. It's where you drive. Hundreds of times a day, we encounter conflicts over who gets what. And what's fascinating, and this is saying as a law professor, these are all decided more or less outside the law. The law is highly, highly overrated. We tell our students this every year, much to their surprise. And instead, all these conflicts are decided by just a small handful of ownership stories. This is true all over the world. It always has been, it always will be. And our drive to own is hardwired. It goes way back in evolutionary history and not just for humans. All species compete for the control of scarce, valuable resources, just like these dogs are doing right now. So now that springtime is coming, you go out for a walk, you might see the birds chirping, and how bucolic, how wonderful. I suspect you might think differently if you heard what they actually are saying. And essentially what they're saying is, don't even think about crossing into my territory. We humans are no different. You spend some time in a playground and I promise you, you will hear kids shouting one word and you all know what that word is, right? It's mine, 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 mine. Mine is one of the first words that kids speak in every culture around the world and the word only grows in importance as we grow older. Ownership is all around us. Think about the common sayings we have for ownership. Now, if I were in a class right now, I would ask basically for volunteers. We'd, we'd pop around the class using Socratic method. And I would ask you, and we could very quickly come up with a dozen, two dozen sayings about ownership. Here are just a few. And we're gonna return to these later, later in the lecture, but let me just you know pop them out. And obviously you can see why these are ownership claims, right? My home is my castle. Possessions nine tenths of the law. First come, first serve. You reap what you sow. Our bodies, ourselves, and the meek shall inherit the earth. We learn these sayings and the others from a very early age. They become so ingrained. Ownership becomes so ingrained, you don't even realize it. It's like fish. They don't realize that they're swimming in water. And my favorite example of this is to go way, way back. So think about the creation legends of Western civilization. What is essentially creation myth for humanity in Greek mythology? catalyst for the birth of civilization, it's Prometheus. And he steals fire from the gods on Mount Olympus. He pays a terrible price for taking what does not belong to him, right? His liver is turned out every day by an eagle. Think, think of a really bad version of the movie Groundhog Day meets birds or, or something like that. It's not good. But human ownership of fire, that sparks civilization. It's remarkably similar, similar in many respects, actually, with, with the biblical story, the Judeo-Christian story of the Garden of Eden. God essentially says, make yourself at home, act like you own the place, do not touch the tree, the fruit of the tree of knowledge, right? It's mine, don't touch. But Adam and Eve can't resist, right? They pluck it, human history begins, but what's interesting is the story doesn't end there. They're treated as trespassers, right? Archangel Michael stands outside the gate with his flaming sword, says, this is no longer your place. So mine has remained for grabs in many, in many respects ever since, but here's, I really think, uh, for me at least, the most, most interesting aspect of this, these stories make no sense without an understanding of ownership, right? Prometheus steals, well, what does stealing mean? Adam and Eve take something that's not theirs, what does that mean? So why does ownership feature so centrally in these creation myths? We argue that at its core, human society exists to help us deal with competing claims to ownership. It might be food, it might be water, sexual partners, territory, so we don't kill each other too often. So let me now return to the first question. So why is recycling, uh, why is recycling, why is reclining, this is an environmentalist speaking, why is reclining an ownership issue? It's because whenever people want the same thing, ownership is up for grabs. And that is everywhere and that is always. It's from the Garden of Eden to the wedge of reclining space behind a seat at 35,000 feet and every place in between. So we get to our second question now. So why are these seat recline battles breaking out now? This didn't used to happen, right? Planes didn't used to make emergency landings over these fights. Well, 
no one thought to ask who controlled the wedge because there was enough space. It, it wasn't it was an issue, but not anymore. Tray table space has become more valuable for laptops. Right? We're using them differently. People are larger, but something else is going on too. Airlines have been shrinking what's called the pitch. That's the distance between seats. Not too long ago, it was 35 inches. Now it's just 28 inches on some planes today. And each inch of pitch that is saved per row, that adds up to six extra seats per flight to sell. There's real money here. So what's happening is airlines are squeezing more passengers inside the same fixed tube. And as the personal space shrinks, the wedge becomes more valuable. As it's more valuable, it's more contested. Passengers are getting angrier at each other. And because most of us assume the wedge is up for grabs, available for either passenger to claim, we fight over it. The ambiguity about who controls the wedge, that actually turns, about to, turns out to be the key to solving our puzzle, right? And it's because the ambiguity is no accident. Airlines actually do have a rule. You have a right to recline, but they don't announce it and they rarely enforce the rule. I'll bet very few of you actually know that this rule exists. I didn't before we started this research. So why is that? Airlines are masters of ownership engineering. Those inches of space, those are their core product and they engineer them using the advanced ownership tool that we call deliberate ambiguity. When ownership is ambiguous, when it's not clear who owns what, airlines know that people like us are gonna mostly fall back on politeness and good manners, not on law, not on rules. No one's going to court over whether you can recline or not. We work it out between ourselves. And while that's happening, the airlines are profiting. Deliberate ambiguity lets them sell the same wedge twice on every seat, on every flight. Once for you to recline, and once for me, for my knees, and for my laptop. And that's even better, well, for the airlines that is, because that's creating conflict in economy class. And that conflict, that discomfort, is creating a market for spacious, higher priced seats up front. So the answer to our second question, why are these battles breaking out now? It's because airlines are using an advanced tool of ownership design to profit from the conflict they create. And that's the reason that most airlines actually ban the knee defenders. They wanna preserve that ambiguity. So let me now turn this back to Michael. Thanks, Jim. So we'll go to our third question, which is who's the villain and who's the hero? To answer this, we actually need to expand our cast of characters beyond this guy, beyond James. Some of you may remember this image. This was a video that Wendy Williams shot last year. It went viral, millions of people saw this. It was exactly a year ago uh, that she shot this just before the pandemic. Uh, she's in the red sweater there. She reclines her seat. And you can see that the guy in front there, I mean, the guy behind her, he's in the last row, so he can't recline. Um, so he gets totally squished and gets really mad and starts banging the headrest like a, like a metronome. Um, millions of people watched Wendy's video uh, and they debated like, who's the jerk? Uh, and who's in the right here? Is that the guy recliner in front or is it the guy in back? Is it Wendy or is it James? Actually, what I want to do, if this is okay with you all, is see what you think. So I'm going to put up a poll. I don't know how many of you are like poll savvy. Um, I was not, but let's give it a try. Uh, um, so what I want you to do is to, um, uh, the poll goes on the screen here, um, just click, you know, is it okay to recline your airplane seat on a crowded plane if somebody is behind you? Yeah, if it can recline, uh, I'm reclining. Or you know, no, don't do it. You should ask. So let me give you like five or 10 more seconds. Everyone comfortable having weighed in? You know, there's no, there isn't a right answer or wrong answer. So I'm curious to see like what you all, uh, what you all uh, think about this. Okay, so let's stop there. Um, whoops, uh, share results. There we go. Okay. So I don't know if you can all see this. Um, in this crowd, it turns out that about two thirds of you are recliners. Uh, basically two thirds of you support Wendy. And actually Ellen DeGeneres, she's with you. She says, unless the seat punches you, uh, don't punch back. Um, about a third of you are supporting the guy in back. You're saying, just don't do it. And actually the Delta CEO, Ed Bastien, he said, yeah, he agrees with you. He says, Wendy should have asked uh, before, uh, before, she leaned, uh, before she leaned back. Polls usually, I mean, this is actually, you guys are a surprising crowd. Actually, Jim and I are going to we're kind of give each other a look, like what's going on here? The polls normally split 50-50 
on this. Um, we've done this uh, poll for many different audiences. National polls as well have had about a 50-50 split. And you guys are leaning towards reclining. So it's possible that this alumni crowd is like a more tired than average crowd. Or maybe you have a better theory. Anyway, whether you voted for reclining or for knee defense, um, what I'm confident about is that most of you were not in doubt about your own view. But maybe some of you are surprised about how much of the audience agrees with you. Like if you're on the Wendy side, like how is it possible that a third of the people behind you think that you're being, you're in the wrong? Or for those of you in the back, how is it possible that two thirds of the people uh, disagree with you? How can that be? And what's going on here is that mine may seem obvious and natural to each of us, however we voted. But this ownership conflict, like every conflict, is really a storytelling battle. And what's remarkable is that when things first come to be owned, that battle always draws from just six simple stories. So if you voted with Wendy, you're asserting what we call the attachment story. It is Michael, my- I need to interrupt for a quick sec. The, the slides are not progressing. Oh, uh, there we go. Um, so if you would have, so let's go back to Wendy. So Wendy's story is the following. So if you're basically voting that you can recline, what you're saying is that that button there on the slide that I was trying to get to, like that's what controls the wedge. It's mine because it is attached to something mine. The button is what controls the wedge. And this is true when you buy land. So you just get a deed of paper, but that deed of paper is just two dimensional. So it's attachment, it's the same principle as the reclining seat that, that says like, do you own the oil or the water below the ground? Do you own the air above? Like, can a plane fly above your land? The answer is yes. How about a drone? Can a drone fly above your land? And the answer to that is unclear. So whenever there's some new resource like a drone or solar power or wind potential, in all of those cases, whether or not the landowner gets control of that is determined by attachment. So attachment is the most important ownership principle that most people have never heard of. It dates back actually thousands of years. And it's what sort of motivates the feeling your home is your castle. Um, it's also the most important tool it turns out that we have to fight um, to slow climate change. Um, so for those of you who voted with James, James Beach, um, we have to move on to the next slide. Um, that's a different story. So the story there for the knee defender story is possession. Possession is nine tenths of the law. So possession is saying like that space, that, that um, the space for my laptop, it's mine because I am holding onto it. That is just as fundamental a story as attachment. And that's the story that traces back to our territorial animal instincts, the, <clears throat> the bird and the, um, and the uh, dogs that we showed you earlier. What James is saying there, he's saying, my knees, my laptop, that's what holds the space. So when the seat reclines into it, it feels like a trespass. Attachment and possession are two of just six. Um, if you're running the slides, can you, um, there we go, okay, great. Um, attachment and possession are two of the, just the six simple stories that we have to claim everything in the world, absolutely everything. The third story is first in time, first come, first served. It's mine because I got it first. We use this story all the time. This is how kids line up for the good humor truck. Um, this is how countries claim space for satellites up in orbit. Fourth story, labor. It's mine because I worked for it. This story goes back to the Bible. You reap what you sow. It's reward for labor. That's the intuition behind why we grant like patents to inventors, why we have copyrights for artists. Fifth story, self-ownership. It's mine because it comes from my body, our bodies ourselves. This is the ownership story at stake. Like when we fight over, for example, like, you know, should we be able to sell our eggs or our sperm or our spare kidney? Should college athletes be able to uh, profit from their celebrity? Should your employer be able to lock you in with a non-compete or a non-disclosure agreement? Those are all fights over self-ownership. And finally, the last story is family. It's mine because I am in the family. Like we may say the meek shall inherit the earth, but the reality of family ownership today is way more troubling. America now has a parallel, insanely generous family ownership system for the super rich and a different, harsher law for the rest of us. I don't mean this metaphorically, literally, we have two different systems for family ownership. 
Everything you own, everything you want, traces back to some original somebody asserting one of these six stories. And conflicts arise when you assert one story, I reply with another. We each claim the moral high ground. We each insist on the rightness of our story. And that's where we get stuck. But the really cool thing is that this simple story about reclining seat battles, that plays out across the economy and with way higher stakes than just that wedge of space. Jim? Thanks, we'll do the next slide, please. So more and more, we are living our lives online, right? And our, our internet activities, these reveal all kinds of things about us, what we buy, where we travel, even our health status. And taken together, this data, it's known as our click stream. So I'm sure some of you said, you know what, let's, uh, let's look into going to Chicago for the weekend or, or wherever. And this amazing thing happens. And that is no matter where else you go on the web, all of a sudden these ads start popping up about shows in Chicago, things to do in Chicago, right? All these things, Chicago. Uh, why is that? Well, it's because the travel site tracked your clicking and sold that information to advertisers. These click streams, our likes, our looks, they're worth hundreds of billions of dollars and this powers the internet economy. Now, we're used to thinking of this as a privacy uh, concern, but it actually turns on ownership. And it really is one of the central questions for our time. So we're gonna put up another poll here. If we can dive, let's see if, if that works. Michael, can, can you bring it up? Um, I can't do it, but if I, if I, can our host do it, please? And if it doesn't, that's fine. You can just, oh, there we go, okay. So is it okay that Amazon and Facebook owns your clickstream, right? So yeah, look, that's the price I pay to use their services. No, 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 clickstream is mine. Okay, variance, you're getting some strong, some strong results. Okay, if we could, uh, let me do uh, five more seconds. Okay, it's all, it's all coming out pretty much the same. If we could stop this and share the results, please. Okay, have they, uh, so everyone can see this now? Yeah. Great, so this is, this is very interesting, right? So basically uh, there's some serious disagreement here uh, and the battle is actually playing out right now. And it's typical of a much broader dynamic that Michael was touching on earlier. Whenever there's a new valuable resource that emerges, ownership by definition is ambiguous at first. It's a new resource, right? Who owns it? In this case, the web companies are staking their claim. And here's the thing that's so cool. The settings could not be more different, but it's the same stories in play with seat reclining and with uh, who owns your click streams with online. Ne next slide, please. So Facebook and Amazon, they are telling an attachment story, right? Their data trackers are like the button on the airplane seat. And the argument is that our clickstream data that attaches to their apps, it's theirs. Next slide, please. But we can claim possession and we can say that their trackers are trespassing into our lives. It's possession versus attachment all over again. Facebook and Amazon, and this is why the, the, the seat recliner is such a nice example. I mean, metaphorically speaking, Facebook and Amazon are leaning their data trackers into our virtual labs. And the question is, can we create virtual knee defenders to keep them out? Now, Europe and California have started giving people some control over their data privacy, but in most of America and certainly most of the world, ownership remains up for grabs, it's up in the air. So the very first step to claiming your clickstream is to realize that you are right now in the middle of a storytelling battle for the fate of your online life. So what lessons can we take from this saga of the reclining airline seats? Next slide, please. The most important one is that ownership conflicts are all around us. Whenever people want the same stuff, there's an ownership battle and that's everywhere and always. And furthermore, as the slide shows, as resources become scarcer, the stakes rise for the storytelling battle. We're just using six simple stories. They're the ones we set up originally and this is true in every corner of the world. Now, you may have noticed that we're using Western examples and there's no question, different cultures will emphasize one of these stories over another, but here's the thing, everyone is choosing from the same storybook. So the final point here, next slide please, and perhaps the most important is that ownership, no, back one, is that ownership is always up for grabs. It is always a choice. There is never a necessary correct answer for who gets what. And so we're gonna pivot now. This is kind of the first half of the talk. In the remainder of the talk, we wanna open a window in some detail into how the hidden rules of ownership really work. 
So let's go back now to our basic sayings. Next slide, please. Right, my home is my castle. Possession is nine tenths of the law. First come, first served. Why are these stories so powerful? Well, they just feel natural, they feel fair, they feel simple. But much of what you know about these stories is wrong. Next slide, please. In practice, more and more often, the real ownership story is my home is not my castle. Possession is one tenth of the law. And first come is last served. And here's the real sort of take home message we're going to get to. Savvy business, no back, please. Savvy businesses and governments, they already understand this, right? They are skilled at engineering these six simple stories of ownership to steer us to do what they want. And to see how this works, we're going to focus in particular on one of these, and that's first come, first served. Michael, can you take us there? Sure. So first come, first served, has, this is the rule for how people have initially claimed, like, what's my stuff? For like most of human history. And today you go to the deli to get a bagel, it's first in line, step on up. This is the same when you go to the DMV to get a driver's license. This is how water rights are divided in the American West. The next slide. Um, we use a rule called prior appropriation, which means the first to put the water to beneficial use owns the water. Next slide. Um, this is how family um, wealth is passed through most of history. Inheritance goes to the firstborn son. This is Jacob here tricking Isaac so we can claim his older brother's, um, Esau's inheritance. Um, kids are taught from a very early age uh, to line up to get all kinds of things. And you can see why first come first serve is so powerful. Like it feels intuitive, it feels fair. It's super easy to, uh, to apply, to enforce. Kids can do it. They don't need parents to police it. Like they know whose turn it is on the swing. But the thing is first in time doesn't just define itself. Like that's not ever true. This is, this is something we actually drill into our law students. And they're always surprised every year when we say this. First in time is not an empirical fact. It never is. What is first is always a choice. It's always a story. And it is always up for grabs. And to show you how this actually works, I want to take you to the absolute masters of line management of first in time, and that's Disney. Disney markets itself as the most magical place on earth. Next slide. Um, they have 58 million visitors a year. It's America's top honeymoon destination. At least it was until recently. There is one place where Disney is not the most magical place on earth. Next. And that's when you're waiting five hours for a five minute ride on Space Mountain. Next. For that, forget about it. Next. Even when you get inside the ride, there is another endless wait. Kids, at least my kids, my kids are reasonably patient, but they're not, kids in general are not known for their patience, even pretty patient ones. So the problem of first in time is that it created a real headache for Disney. Long lines were annoying next uh, uh, too many customers. The problem was that Disney couldn't engineer the ride to accommodate more people per hour. The challenge became for them, could Disney engineer ownership even if they couldn't engineer the roller coaster? Could they profit from long lines. Next, please. So what they did is they introduced something called a fast pass. What that does is lets families skip the regular line for a fixed time later with a short wait. So if you plan ahead and you can get up to three of these fast passes per day, you're not spending your whole day waiting in line. Next, please. Uh, for kids who um, want to take that seven dwarfs train, I'm sorry, go back a few. Back one more. There we go. Uh, for kids who want to take the seven dwarfs train, uh, they're not so, you know, they're not so grumpy anymore. Next slide. They're happy. This works. This works. This when when uh, when Jim and I do this, and we have like our we have we're like a seamless machine. We're so grateful um, for for the for for for, all, for the AV here, but it, we're gonna we're gonna lose some of the surprise, which is which is okay. Um, but anyway, so who wins from this from this fast pass? It's Disney, actually. I mean, you're you moved you move ahead a little bit, but Disney is the one who really wins with fast pass. What Disney does is it gets grumpy families moving around and spending money. They aren't waiting angrily in line anymore. It's no longer old fashioned first in time. That change though, for most, for, for most of us, it feels pretty accessible, pretty open if you've been to Disneyland or Disney World. But everyone knows that like you can get a fast pass if you plan ahead. So the question for Disney was, they got families circulating. They got them spending money, but could Disney do even better? Could they design first in time to profit directly from this line waiting hassle that they've created. And here's where Disney took the next step. Next, please. Uh, the, which, which was the genius step in ownership design. There are some really wealthy people who have a lot more money than time. 
So for them, Disney created something called a private VIP tour. It's like a super duper fast pass. It lets you skip every ride, every line all day long for just three to $5,000 um, on top of the admissions price. So if you want to ride Splash Mountain five times in a row, no waiting, you know, knock yourselves out. What happens now is that Disney profits directly from the long lines it's created. It's, based, it's very much the same as the airlines creating a market for business class by ensuring misery and economy. But unlike for the airlines where the seat is not the destination, for Disney, there's a catch. If it visibly is moving too many families to the front, it's gonna anger all those grumpy families who are waiting patiently in line. Next, please. Um, so Disney assigns a guide to discreetly uh, help every group of to VIPs to cut the line. So for some rides, what Disney does, what the guides do, is they bring you in through the side door or an exit. That's what's happening actually in this slide. So the problem for Disney was that old fashioned first in time, it just left too much money on the table. So Disney changed who counts as first. They started with the fast pass, they moved to VIP tours. And what that means is all those families, almost everyone who's waiting patiently in line, they can't tell anything is amiss. They never realize that the real rule has become first come, last served. Jim? Thanks, we can go to the next slide, please. So realize what's going on here, okay? This is one of the take home messages. Disney is using ownership like a remote control and they're steering us to do what they want. Next slide, please. Disney redefines first twice, All right? So the fast pass that steers families to spend money on the Mickey merchandise, those giant turkey legs, rather than idling in line. The VIP pass is gonna steer one percenters to pay thousands to avoid that line. So the low value customers, they're waiting in endless lines. They're the only ones actually still playing by the old story of first come, first served. So ownership here, and in many other examples, works as social engineering. The owner designs first to steer us to do what they want. Now, wherever you see long lines, next slide, please. You also need to realize people are smart and they're gonna be creative entrepreneurs who also can profit by re-engineering first. And here's a great example, particularly for the lawyers in the audience. Supreme Court offers an amazing show in DC, a free show. You can sit only steps from the justices, but there are only about a hundred free seats available. They're on those benches on the side there that are available for the public. That is a scarce valued resource. Next line, please. Uh, next, next slide, please. The way you get in is through a line. It's first come, first serve, no cutting. And people obviously line up well ahead for the big cases. But here's, here's the weird thing. Just before the doors open, the ragged looking people at the front of the line, they exchange places with these well-dressed folks wearing gray suits, carrying briefcases. So what is going on here? Next slide, please. Welcome to the line standing industry, right? This is the website of linestanding.com, but there are others. And they charge clients up to $6,000 to get into these arguments first. They pay minimum wage to hired line standards who are waiting for days in the rain and the cold. And this is a standard expense for lawyers and for lobbyists. The fact is, if you go to DC and you wanna see a big Supreme Court argument, the odds are you can't get in. So we wanna ask you now, how do you react to this? How do you react to paid line standing? Is it undemocratic? Is it, is it unfair? Does it bother you? Or maybe on the flip side, it's the market at its best, right? They're creating jobs to meet demand. So if we can bring up the next poll, please. All right, and the poll is gonna ask you when it comes up, is it okay, here we go, is it okay to pay someone to hold your spot in line and then jump in when it's your turn in front? In other words, what do you think of, of paid line standing? Okay, 30, 40 people, 40% 40 have voted. Let's wait till we get to, uh, oh, it's going pretty fast actually. All right, so. Okay, numbers are getting, we, we can actually stop it here. Um, so essentially, this is very interesting. So essentially this is 50-50, this is uh, basically. Can you all see the results, Michael? Yeah. Yeah, so this is 50-50. Um, so a few things here. First of all, so as Michael said, we've done this at a lot of different places. Um, when I did this at the Bren School, where I teach at UC Santa Barbara, it's a school of the environment, two thirds said, "Ugh, we hate line standing. When we did it at the Columbia Law School with Michael students, two thirds said, we love line standing. Right? There's, this, there's a huge division of opinion on this. And this group is almost literally 50-50. Um, but here's the thing, however you voted, the shift, the shift uh, to first come last served, which essentially is, is what line standing is doing, this isn't just about money, right? There are also democratic values that are at stake here. 
So think of it this way, old fashioned first in time, that rewards those with the spare time needed to get there first. Next, line, uh, next slide, please. First come last serve by contrast, that rewards wealth. This favors those who can pay for the time of others. So what we're seeing is quietly across the economy, owners are quite literally rewriting the first in time story from time to money, from equality to privilege, from first to last. And so let me, let me sort of give you this challenge. Next time you're waiting in a long line, ask yourself, are those ahead of you being paid to wait? And what does that mean for you as a consumer and as a citizen? Next slide, please. And one more. And what's interesting about this in the current moment is we are seeing this in real time with battles over access to the COVID vaccine. So everyone agrees frontline health workers, they should be first. But after them, all consensus breaks down. Should it be the elderly, the prisoners, the teachers? In New Jersey, smokers are getting priority. Each group, each interest group is defining first to promote its particular values. In the last year to tie these stories together, paid line standards have actually shifted from queuing to buy new iPhones and theater tickets to waiting in line for COVID tests and now vaccines. Here's the thing, COVID vaccines don't administer themselves. Owners always face a choice to define who's first and who served last. Next slide, please. So we had this slide early in the talk. As you can see, one kid shouting is mine, I'm holding on to it. The other screaming, no, 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 I had it first. So at this point in the talk, I hope it's clear to you, this is not just a screaming match. This is a storytelling battle between possession for one child and first in time for the other. And these are just two of the six simple stories everyone uses to claim everything. And also we've shown by this point, it's not just kids in playgrounds. Businesses and governments are using the exact same stories and they're using these to decide who can recline, who owns your click streams, back please, um, who gets the vaccines first and hundreds of other conflicts that are all around us. Ownership is a form of social engineering. And we focused in this last part of the talk on the shift uh, from first come to last serve, first come first serve to first come last serve but realize savvy owners, uh, uh, sorry, savvy owners are skilled in turning all six ownership stories upside down. They are masters of ownership engineering. And the whole point is to get us to do what they want without realizing that anything has changed. And so Michael, if you could, if you could please take us uh, through to the end. Thanks, Jim. So uh, next slide, please. Um, so now I'm gonna just give you some parting puzzles, some, some quick hits um, on, the, on the way out. Um, so these are some puzzles of ownership in the 21st century. So I want to ask another, we're going to do some lightning polls, polls here to wrap it up. Um, next poll, please. So when you click buy now, do you own that book? Or you say, yeah, yeah, that book is mine. It's like my paperback or my CD. Mm -hmm. Or do you say, no, 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 um, Amazon, if they want to, they can just delete it uh, right, off of my, uh, right off of my device. So what do you think it means when you click buy now? Uh, online? Is it just like the paperback or not quite? Let me give you three or four more seconds to weigh in. And then I'm going to end the poll and show you the results. And this is really, I think this, this always blows my mind. So here we go. Let's share the results. Um, three quarters of you um, uh, believe that it's the same to buy it online. When you click buy now, you, you, you know, that means buy now. And the quarter of you say, um, uh, no, it doesn't really work that way. Um, so here's the thing, uh, those of you who are saying no uh, are more or less right, that you don't really own it. Uh, for those of you who said yes, a recent very large scale study showed about 85% of people actually believe the answer is yes. Most of us believe that. We say possession is nine tenths of the law and that feels true online, just like in, just like in real life. It turns out not to be right. So what Amazon and Apple and all these online retailers are doing is they are very thoughtfully and carefully with a, real, a lot of design behind this, they are activating that ownership instinct. Those dogs, those birds, the kids fighting, that instinct is so powerful. And they're doing it using that little shopping cart on that buy now button. What they've done though online is quietly remade the rule. Online possession is one tenth of the law. They are actually free to delete content right off your devices and they have done so. Turns out there's actually a large and growing gap between what you feel you own and what you actually own. What that means is online retailers capture an unearned premium on every download you make. Here's our second puzzle to, to, for you to go out with tonight. Okay, um, is it okay to share your HBO password with a friend? What do you think? 
okay, this, yeah, everyone does it. I'm not sure if it's legal, it's legal-ish, everyone does it. Or no, that, that's, that's like a federal crime. You can't share your password with a crime. With, you can go to jail for that. All right, let me give you a couple more seconds. This is our, we're just doing our lightning round here of polls. Okay, yes, okay to share. No, not, let me share, let me share the results. All right, so here we go. And you all split 50-50. I love this stuff. I love this stuff. Isn't that amazing? So you all basically are saying, um, half of you are saying it's okay to share and half of you are saying it's not. It turns out both are exactly the right. That's why part of why these always split about 50-50. It turns out everyone shares passwords. When we ask our law students, 100% of them share passwords and it's a federal crime. HBO knows what you're doing. And it turns out they actually encourage you to share your password illegally. Like they're not coming after you. That's why people do it, even though it's a crime. Netflix does this too. How is that possibly the case? Why on earth would Netflix not just tolerate, but actually encourage theft of its core product? And the answer is that tolerated theft is another of the advanced strategies of ownership design that we have found. We talked about strategic ambiguity earlier with the airplane wedge. Tolerated theft is just as powerful. Actually, Jim and I have an article in last week's um, Harvard Business Review on exactly this and how savvy businesses use these advanced strategies uh, for, for profit. Anyway, so what HBO is doing here is using tolerated theft for long-term customer acquisition. What they're trying to do in the words of the company's president is to quote him, they're trying to build video addicts. They're like giving away a bit of supply uh, to get you hooked. Third puzzle. Um, uh, why, um, let's see, um, can you advance two more slides, please? Next one, there we go. Okay, so this is, a, this is the one that really blows my mind. How is it that South Dakota has become the world's leading money haven? Like if you're super rich, you already know this. You know that South Dakota is crushing Switzerland and the Cayman Islands. That fact, it may surprise you, and the reason that this has happened is that in America, it's states that set up ownership by and large, not the federal government, not the constitution. And that means that one deviant state like South Dakota has the ability to impoverish the rest of us. And what they're doing is they're very quietly entrenching America's new wealth aristocracy. Already 60% of wealth in America is inherited and it goes up, not because of nature, not because of market forces, it goes up because of states like South Dakota that have created an alternate legal system for the very rich. Last puzzle, next slide. Another one here, this is maybe a more optimistic one. Why does New York City have the world's best drinking water? It wins blind taste tests against the fanciest bottled water. There are no billion dollar treatment plants in New York City. The water that you drink comes basically straight from the Catskills. It's a little chlorine within it, but it's the largest untreated uh, municipal water supply in the country. And the reason New York water is so clean is not because of you know, infrastructure of, but based on concrete, it's based on infrastructure based on ownership engineering and genius ownership engineering. It's actually a real hero of this story. It's got a city employee in, uh, named Al Appleton. And what he ended up doing is investing New York City in trees upstate instead of in concrete to treat water. What he did is he paid upstate farmers as if the water filtering services that their farms and wetlands provide as if those services were attached to their land. So he basically created a mechanism like that airplane wedge. He created a button and said, we're gonna pay you not to lean back, not to cut down their trees or wetlands. All of our best solutions for solving climate change, they all involve redesigning attachment, that button on the wedge on the airplane thing to make trees basically worth more standing than uh, cut down. Next slide, please. Um, these four puzzles, and, uh, and the hundred more puzzles that we couldn't get to tonight, all of them snap into focus once you begin to look at them through like, what's my stuff lens. So um, I wanna just, next slide, please. I'm gonna just wrap up here and go to questions. I wanna leave you with a challenge. The challenge is this, if you pick up any newspaper any day, if you're watching this today, today, if you're watching it you know, a week from when we gave the talk, whatever day you pick the paper up, I am 100% confident that a front page story turns on the hidden rules of ownership, the six simple stories. And I'm quite confident, the reason I can be sure is that those simple stories, those six stories that we talked about today, they frame every struggle over the things all of us want. And that is a lot of things. Once you see how this works, it's, you really can't unsee it. Like a whole, the world shifts a little bit. And once you can see it, my hope for all of you 
is that you can be more effective advocates as parents, as consumers, and as citizens. Next slide, please. If you'll indulge me before we go to Q&A, I'll one more minute and then we'll, I'm mindful of the time here. Um, uh, one of the challenges for us in writing a book that's come out um, during the pandemic is that it's really hard to get it, get, to get it noticed. Um, so um, I hope uh, for those of you um, who follow social media, if you follow us, we would love for you to share, spread the word about this. If you have audiences um, that you know would be interested in hearing about this, we, Jim and I love talking about this stuff. So we would love uh, to, if you would connect us with people who might be, who might wanna hear it. And finally, um, on our book website, mindthebook.com, we have a ton of uh, free resources to, to go check out. So we have a downloadable free ebook on the false promise of the buy now button. We have a bunch of uh, cool two minute videos on stories we couldn't talk about today. Anyway, what Jim and I did is we wrote this book to be basically for readers of Freakonomics or Nudge or Tipping Point. Um, so it makes a great gift, just to give a little plug for us. Anyway, we hope that you make uh, mine yours. So with that, uh, next slide. Um, let's go back to um, let's go back to Donna and uh, Q and A. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Jim. Um, oh, that certainly was fascinating, and boy, it gave made me pause in several different areas about how to be a good ownership consumer. Um, so we have a couple of questions that have come in that I want to share um, and for either of you to chime in. Why can't a lot of this be explained by either an explicit or implicit contract, including buying a book on Amazon or buying a seat that reclines on a plane? Great. So yeah, you absolutely can. All of this can be resolved by contract. Um, but contract always presumes when we have that deal that there's some underlying agreement about who starts off with what. So contract builds on who owns what. It builds on whose stuff is it. Um, and uh, in, the, in the airline example, so you asked about that, it's absolutely the case uh, that the airlines could have a rule, but they actually deliberately don't want to. They, if they do have that rule, they can't sell that wedge to both of us. So they don't want there to be a contract. What they want is for us to work it out by being polite. So politeness and ambiguity are actually deliberate ownership tools of very savvy companies. Contracting law is actually a less valuable tool for them. That's one of the basic messages we try to drill home with our law students is law is overrated. I've said that earlier, I'm gonna say it again, um, that contract uh, is a less valuable solution than ambiguity in, some of the, in many of these ownership disputes. And we talked a little bit about the COVID vaccines and getting tests. What do you think would be the best public policy for how to roll out vaccines to everyone? Yeah, so uh, one of the things I think it's important to realize is that COVID vaccines are just another example of line standing. I mean, fundamentally, it's no different than Disney, right? Who's going to get on Space Mountain first? Who's going to get the vaccine first? And the, the advice that we have, and we have a bunch of examples in the book for how different companies and governments use line standing, um, is to be much more transparent about what the goal is. Right, so just to give a very brief example, everyone's familiar with HOV lanes, right? Fast lanes um, on, on the highway. At rush hour, uh, normally it's first come first serve for the fast lanes, not during rush hour. There in most cities, you have to be carpooling, maybe an electric car. They're doing that because they have a very clear goal of improving air quality, reducing pollution from rush hour. Our point about the COVID vaccine uh, is that one reason it's such a mess is that governments aren't clear, state governments aren't clear What's our actual goal? What are we trying to maximize here? Instead of trying to sort of please all these different groups that have nice arguments, may, if the goal is you know, address those, help those who are most at risk with health, that tells you what to do. The problem right now is it's as if you know, Disney, these other um, places don't really know why they want someone to be in front of the line. Um, there was a question about, uh, definitely a New York question, twice, um, Amy recently had people park their cars in her snow cleared spot in front of her house, blocking her access to walking to the street. Was her being incensed fair? Michael? Well, well this is, we, we love this stuff. Like this is what we live for is these wackadoo stories. So it, in different um, parts of the country, they're actually with, with snow, there's really different rules for parking. So in Boston, for example, if you dig out your car, that is 100% your space. Somebody 
uh, Parkson at the end of the day, you, you put, a, you put a, a chair actually in the street in Boston or Chicago, Pittsburgh, uh, Philadelphia, you put your chair in the street. And if someone um, uh, moves the chair and parks, they will not be surprised that their uh, tires have been slashed or cars been keyed. And the police won't intervene. They're like, you know the rule. In Boston, the chair holds the space. In New York, the general rule has been the chair does not hold the space. You lose the chair and the parking space. So we just have different languages of possession. Like actually birds as well have different dialects for chirping, it turns out. Bird, you know, sparrows in Boston will have a different chirp from a sparrow in New York. And that's also true for the language of possession. It's a language we all learn as kids and it has regional variations. So in New York City, the general rule has been uh, you lose the chair and the space. So when that gets violated, people get, if, if, if you do try to hold the space, it's like not part of New York possession <laughs> rules, which are outside of the law. It's all outside of the law. It's all totally illegal. It's really interesting. And you bring into cultural and society and certainly the New Yorkers and you see, you know, when somebody, if you have a passenger and you see a spot, they stand in the spot while you drive around the block. Like, is that okay? And there are some, that could be a poll question because some people will say yes and some people will say no. So, um, huge percentage of the population uh, watched the Oprah Winfrey interview of Harry and Meghan. How, um, there's the differing opinion whether Meghan has the rights to her freedom, freedom within the established monarchy. How do you see ownership and, you know, good consumer and perspective on this? So for us, the answer to that goes back to, um, actually this is gonna be a little bit of a sort of, a, maybe a little bit of a jump, but the answer for us goes back to slavery. Like the origin of self-ownership, that's how we think about self-ownership in America, uh, goes back to the real, the original sin of ownership in America, which is uh, ownership by white people of African-Americans. So we have a, a very uh, cautious sense in this country about allowing um, ownership by us, of, by someone else of us. Um, and being part of a royal family has an element of being owned, just like being a, a, a sports player on a team. Uh, has, they, have a, they have a long, they can, in baseball, there used to be something called a reserve clause. The reserve clause is basically the baseball version of Megan uh, in the royalty. Like once you're in on the team in old timey, old timey baseball, you were there for the rest of your life. You couldn't leave. And when that was eventually overturned in the 70s, um, when, when uh, um, during something actually called the Curt Flood Act, he, he fought against it. When that reserve clause was overturned, it actually was overturned and fought about largely in terms of thinking about what does it mean to be a free person? How do we end, in a sense, the modern version of slavery of baseball players? For royalty, there's very much the same question. How do you regain your freedom out of this hereditary uh, monarchy? So my guess is that the in England, you would get a somewhat different answer from what you would get here. And that actually translates to things like you know, non-compete clauses. Maybe a, probably a quarter of the um, adults in the audience tonight or some large percentage of you have non-compete clauses in your employment contracts, um, which also has the same quality of being sort of tied into a place that's very hard to get out of. But the, the sort of overarching sense in our country has been uh, that you can get out of relationships that you don't want to get, that you don't want to be in, not just marriages, uh, but also families like the royal family. Hmm. So um, Greg Nell asked the question, how do we solve these issues in society? How do we resolve the decline issue? How do we ensure that the middle and lower class can still participate without being marginalized by the uber rich? Michael, oh, either one. I mean, I mean this, is, this is the stuff that we, we, we you know, this is why we wrote the book is exactly this, is that these, you know, ultimately what it comes down to is each of us being a more effective advocate, you know, a lot of the, what we talk about is stuff as a parent, mm -hmm. but also as a consumer, how do you fight back as a consumer? If you're in California, where Jim is zooming in from, uh, California actually has a recent law that provides a lot of data privacy for your online data, where they can't just track you without your permission, uh, we, or you can opt out of it. And the same is true in Europe. In, in New York, where, where I am, uh, that's not true at all. You have very few protections. So part of what we hope for, from, from this book, our real goal mm -hmm. is to uh, have people be aware that these stories that feel so natural, it feels like, how do you possibly contest this? It's just a given. That these are all story stories that somebody else is telling. And if you understand that they're telling, for example, with data, a clickstream story, or if, with um, South Dakota, they're telling basically a certain family ownership story, that you now say, okay, I, I see the story they're telling. There's a different story I can tell. And there's a, you know, what it means as an engaged, active um, citizen is that when you have the power of knowing what those stories are, you can fight back. So um, on each of the stories that we told tonight, uh, there are both personal things you can do about opting out, 
um, uh, or in the air airplane wedge, you know, the airplane wedge, if you pay 20 bucks to the person in front, they'll still recline. If you say, please don't, they'll still recline. If you want to solve the airplane wedge personally, you offer to buy them a drink or a snack and they, most people won't recline. Like that turns out to work. But for each story, there is a solution. And for some of them, they're personal. And many of them, what the personal story mm -hmm. is, is being an engaged, active citizen. Yeah, so the book, we actually spent a lot of time thinking about the title. And you know, mine is very visceral and such. But the subtitle is How the Hidden Rules of Ownership Control Our Lives. And it really, to answer the question, which is a great question, one of the things we're, we want to do with this book is to allow people to spot those hidden rules. All right, so what I tell my students all the time is, you can't play the game well if you don't know the rules. Right? And a lot of those rules are not obvious. And so we wrote the book basically, as Michael said earlier, to allow you to see it differently. And once you see what's happening with ownership, you really can't unsee it. So what about the armrest between two seats on a plane? Who owns that? You know, I was thinking about that. I actually own that divider. So there's an entrepreneur who came up with a clip-on armrest divider for airplane seats. You can bring it on the airplane with you, clip it on the armrest, and it creates a little ledge uh, for both of you, a little divider in between. So you get exactly half the armrest. So everything that you can imagine, whether it's drones flying up above or fracking foil underneath, it is the exact same story as that little armrest divider that you can buy on Amazon. It's like 25 bucks. And so, you know, this is also one of those questions who said law is overrated. I promise you, no one has ever gone to court over the shared armrest. We, we work it out. Right. Stay out of the, the court room, right? Listen, if that's the one lesson anyone takes tonight, like, you know, you don't want to be in court. <laughs> you want to do anything else you can, you can to avoid it. Um, so for all of us listening, our Columbia alumni, um, wh what last last piece of advice do you have for us um, besides buying the book and reading it and learning more? Um, but share with us one additional piece of advice. Yeah, Michael, this is your crowd, so take us out. <laughs> oh, one advice. I, um, what's, the, what's the thing I want to tell you all? Have fun with it. You know, like part of what, part of what we enjoy about, about ownership is just, is, is just walking down the street and just saying, wow, that's cool. Like what's, what's driving, like, like what, what's happening with that line? Like what, like in New York City where I am, like right in front of my apartment, all of a sudden there were all these restaurants like in what used to be parking spaces. It's like, once you start to notice it, it's just like everything around you has this kind of weird, fun, cool, different vibe to it. And I hope that, I hope that people start, maybe just from the talk tonight, I hope you take away uh, some be, just beginning to see like, wow, there's like a whole other prism for how I can think about the world. Actually, before I, before I turn it over to Jim, I just want to thank um, when these events get put on, um, people who are listening don't realize how much um, staff time goes on behind the scenes. I really want to just thank uh, Gibson, who's on the call, Brittany for, for running, um, for keeping us on track when, when my computer uh, crapped out. There's a lot that goes on. And really, it's important to people realize how much, how, much, uh, how much goes on behind the scenes. Jim, do you, want to, do you want to take us home? Yeah, so the last thing I would say is, you know, as, as Michael said, once you start to look at the world through the prism of ownership, a lot of things start to make sense. Uh, and not only do you get some answers, but I think what's even better, particularly for an intellectually curious crowd like Columbia grads, is you start to ask different questions. Uh, and I think that really, for this crowd in particular, is a take home message. You know, ask yourself, how, how is ownership working here? All right? And why is this resource being, being, uh, being shared or, or sold or allocated this way and not another? What's, what's really hidden about the, the story that's going on here? Thank you so much, Michael and Jim. Um, certainly you educated us, you entertained us, and you may, made us pause and hopefully we'll continue to pause and think more about our interactions with others um, in day to day. And um, for many of us, we haven't been on a plane in a long time, but we certainly will think about this the next time we are. So we're so appreciative for you for joining us tonight. Thank you. Um, to all of you who participated, thanks for all the comments and questions. Feel free to reach out to Jim and Michael with any additional questions or thoughts you may have. Our next Columbia at Home program will be the World of European Wine with members of the Columbia Alumni Association Wine Industry Network, a discussion about the current state of wine throughout Europe, as well as tips on unique varietals, pairings, and sustainability. It will be on March 25th at 7 p.m. 
Greenwich Mean Time. So uh, we're doing it for those of alumni who are residing in Europe. It'll be 2 p.m. Eastern, so happy hour in New York City will start much earlier. And I guess in California, it will be brunch, that's for sure. You can register at alumni.columbia.edu. And thank you so much for joining us. Stay healthy and safe, and we hope to see you again soon. Bye. Bye-bye.